Gracias a ustedes por tenerme aquí hoy. Um, antes de empezar con la presentación, quería hablar un poquito sobre mí. Um, talking a little bit about my academic preparation um, and where I'm from and my experiences as a heritage learner myself and as a scholar. Um, so this is from when I graduated my PhD. <laughs> But then uh, this photo here represents my Spanish, right? Growing up with um, a grandma who spoke Spanish, but she never taught Spanish to my mom. Um, and for context, I was born in the Midwest, in Indiana, but I grew up in Ohio. Um, so when my family, my grandma's family, came to um, the U.S. from de la frontera, no, from Coahuila, my grandma made the conscious choice to stop using her Spanish, right, and to not use her, not to teach her children Spanish, um, specifically. Right, so mi abuela nació en los años 40, mi mamá en los años 60, um, and Indiana en los años 60, especialmente donde, estaba, donde estaban ellos, no, en un lugar muy rural, um, was not very friendly to people who spoke different languages besides English, right? So, por eso mi mamá se llama Audrey, because what's more American than Audrey Hepburn, right? Um, pero después, cuando nací yo en los años 80, my grandma was in a different place, right? I mean, ya era abuela en vez de mamá. Um, había una comunidad más grande de hispanos en el lugar donde vivían ellos. She had a really big church community. Um, and I feel like maybe there wasn't as much pressure for her um, to not right, use her language or languages, right, at that point, because English had become a very important language for her as well. Um, just growing up in that area, spending time there, having children there, developing a life there. Um, so she did teach me Spanish. Um, and sometimes I wonder too if like the way that I look influenced that at all because she knew that I wouldn't have the same types of experiences, negative experiences that she had um, or my mom had um, because I'm white. Um, and I can't I haven't been able to theorize those things with her because she passed away when I was 16. Um, but uh, como esas son las cosas en que pienso, and those are the experiences that I bring with me like into the classroom, coming from a place, uh, a predominantly white institution for my bachelor's, and then coming to um, Texas, right, to do my master's where I had completely different experiences in the classroom. And since I came to Texas, more than like 15 years ago, I've stayed in the Southwest, right? Did my PhD in, um, at the University of um, Arizona. My concentration was in Spanish as a heritage language, which I didn't even know that there was a term <laughs> for heritage learners um, or that could include me um, until I got to my master's degree, which I think a lot of us have those experiences. So just, just kind of taking that as a point of departure and understanding um, that those are the types of um, experiences that have led me to want to do this type of work um, in heritage language classes and focusing on community work um, in, in particular, right? So, quería hablar un poquito más sobre la universidad en donde estoy, que es UTSA en San Antonio, y saber un poquito más también sobre la ciudad ¿no? de San Antonio. So here's some fast facts. Um, UTSA is a public university. Um, it became an R1 in 2022, and it's one of the uh, only R, uh, HSIs to become R1 instead of an R1 becoming an HSI because of demographic changes. Um, it was founded in 1969. In response to the need for a uh, public four-year institution to serve the um, Mexican-American student population in San Antonio, right? Because we do have a lot of institutions of higher ed in San Antonio, um, but many of them are private institutions, right? Um, most recently, we do have another public four-year institution, um, but it was founded less than, about 10 years ago. Um, it's been an age, at UTSA we have 34,000 students, it's been an HSI since 1994. We currently have um, about 60% Hispanic or Latino student population. Um, we've earned the seal of excelencia in 2020. Uh, and one interesting thing about UTSA is it describes itself as a Hispanic thriving institution, 
which is really interesting instead of saying Hispanic serving. Um, but one thing that I have seen, um, at least on the Hispanic Thriving Advisory Council, is there is no representation there of uh, professors from Spanish. So there are uh, Latine professors who serve on that committee who speak Spanish or use Spanish in their lives, but there's no professor um, or representative that comes from modern languages um, or a background specifically you know, in Espanol. 43% of our students are first gen. Um, and this to me was probably the most interesting and, and what I was thinking about when designing the course that I'm gonna be talking about, which is a service learning course, ¿verdad? 50% of our students are from Bear County, which is where UTSA is located, and 90% of our students are from Texas. So they're very local, um, at least in UTSA, right, which is gonna be a very different student population than here in UT Austin, or maybe in some of the institutions that you work in. We, um, de San Antonio, we have 1.5 million uh, population in the area, 64% of the population is considered Hispanic or Latino to use language from the census, 40% uh, speak a language other than English at home, 37% speak Spanish at home, and 29% of the population have a BA or higher, right? And when we break it down into the other demographic categories, we see kind of some um, disparities taking place, right, about what students are being served and what is their background and where do they come from. So. A little bit about um, SHL at UTSA and el, no, el, la, la razón por la cual quería tener esa clase de service learning because we did not have one before uh, what's going to be this upcoming semester. So hemos tenido clases de herencia en UTSA desde los años 70. But what really surprised me is that there would be decades between course offerings because students would not enroll in the courses, right, por varias razones. And we have been implementing some changes recently uh, in our SHL program. Um, the last wave of SHL classes started probably in 2018, uh, but that class was a TV-based class. Um, so the two classes that we were mostly offering were like a Spanish one and Spanish two, introductory levels. There was a focus on Spanish from Spain. Um, they, the students would watch novelas, and the novelas were, took place in Spain in different times. Um, and the, uh, the idea of those classes, right, was that the students needed to have this academic Spanish, right? Um, and it was confidence building in a way, but also um, it wasn't very critically engaged with the community um, or with US Spanish. So what, what, I, what I noticed when I came to UTSA, which was about two years ago, is that do students have this complicated relationship with grammar, academic Spanish, and corrective feedback? Um, they really want to use their language and their languages because they also want to use Spanglish, um, and who doesn't? And they're interested in learning more about being the creators of class content themselves um, being involved in community engagement opportunities as well as internship opportunities. How are they going to use their languages right, in their future jobs? So um, these are some feedback that we got, um, kind of explaining the same things. They, they want to have more varieties. They don't want to just focus on the same things over and over. Um, they want to be involved in their communities. They want to have a, something that reflects San Antonio. Um, so from there, we decided to create um, different classes. So this is our new website, and you can see here um, kind of just how we define heritage learners, um, the different uh, course paths that we have offered. Mostly we offer the, these beginning courses at the 1,000 and 2,000 level, but we created a lot of them, as you can see, and they were accepted into the new course catalog. There's probably two classes that were already established at the upper division level. Um, but uh, after they, they, they said, okay, you created these classes, uh, now you have to teach them. Now you have to design the course content. <laughs> so, so here we are uh, working on that. What, let me, how, how do I go back to my presentation? Uh-oh.
now I'm lost. I should have never done that. Here we go. Ah. So um, they told me, how about you teach the service learning course? Because we've never had a service learning course um, in the program before. Um, and I said, OK. Um, and this semester, um, I have been working on cultivating the partnerships um, across the city. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about what that has looked like and um, really try to help anybody who's interested in creating a service learning course or adding a service learning component um, to their course. So one thing I forgot to mention is I have this handout here. So you can copy and paste this. I also put it in uh, as a PDF if you wanted to download it so that you can cre uh, go through the discussions and the activities, um, creating your own work through here. Um, and I have put here a folder with different um, articles about service learning specifically in SHL classes. And then there's some examples of activities um, there as well. So it's in there for you. Um, if you complete any of your notes here, it's gonna be visible for everyone. So just make sure to create a copy on your own. Yeah. Okay. So the goal of this class um, is for students to actually do community-oriented project-based work and to partner with different businesses, um, local organizations, uh, cultural or historical centers. And um, before I kind of get into this, I wanted to know more about everyone in the room. What class or classes do you typically teach? Who are your students and where do you teach? So if you could share with your elbow partners around you and then I'll kind of come across the room as well. Let's take about two minutes to do that. Am I good? Okay. Las clases que normalmente enseñamos en el programa de herencia son de nivel 1000 o 2000, right? So we have that typical introductory class um, where we focus on San Antonio um, and we focus on receptive bilinguals. Then we have our bridge class. Um, that is for students who typically have more productive abilities. We go from there to an advanced intermediate class, and then after that, students would start the 3,000 levels, the 4,000 levels. Pero esta clase que voy a enseñar, right, and I'm kind of nervous about it, maybe you guys can help me out, um, es de nivel 4,000. So a lot of them are going to be um, majors um, or minors at least, and many of them are going to be heritage learners because our majors um, at UTSA, many of them have that background. All right, so maybe you are looking to incorporate a component into your class that is for service learning, or maybe you're looking to design a class that is completely right revolved around service learning, y de eso es lo que vamos a hacer. Um, Ahorita. So, de lo que aprendí de ustedes, la mayoría enseñan aquí en Texas. But no, tal vez, no necesariamente aquí en Austin, but around Texas, maybe a couple of people not from Texas. Mm -hmm. Y Minnesota. Yeah. Bien. So, I mean, a lot of this may be relevant, right, to the thing, the, the different uh, topics and themes that you're looking at in your classes. De lo que está, vamos a ver en mi clase. So, um, antes de empezar, quería saber, what is service learning? Um, and what experiences, if any, have you had with service learning? You can write any notes that you want um, in the handout that I provided, um, but I want you to take a minute to think about it. Um, que, what is that definition? What does it look like? How is it different from volunteering, for example? ¿Alguien puede pensar en una definición o quiere compartir con nosotros en lo que piensan cuando piensan de service learning, Emily? But with the 
purpose of using the volunteer work to develop your language and social skills. Right, so like in the context of our classes, right, that would be something that you would want to develop, right? The language skills, the cultural skills. Um, service learning could look different depending on the, the class that it's intended for. Um, but in the context of a Spanish course or a heritage language course, um, we also have this added component of wanting to um, wanting to work on right our language skills, right, or develop the skills that we already have for a different environment. Um, and when I thought of service learning before, I always just thought of like, oh, learning by doing. Um, but it's which is kind of similar, right, to volunteering or maybe some like on-the-job training. Um, you, aren't, you aren't getting paid, right, for this work typically. Um, but, um, so it's similar to volunteering in that way, uh, but the, the, what makes it different is that a course or a component, a service learning course or a service learning component is linked to either course or learning objectives, right? And it's also linked to the learning that's going on in the classroom, right? So that's kind of um, what makes it different from just going somewhere um, and volunteering your time, right? Like doing a cleanup in a certain place. Like what does that have to do with what we're seeing in the course itself, right? Um, and from what I gathered, right, reading different um, articles related to service learning, is we are, especially for heritage courses, we're connecting the language of the classroom with the language of the community, right? Students are critically examining and questioning, right, um, the linguistic and cultural skills that they possess and applying them or times constructing, right, new knowledges in real time or in real life scenarios. Um, we are connecting learning with service in the community and also civic learning. And one thing that was important to me is um, bringing this benefit to all stakeholders. So the organization is getting something out of this, but the student is as well, right? And what does that look like for the student? Um, how can they develop skills that they can use after they graduate? Um, and UTSA, um, doesn't use service learning anymore. They use community engaged learning um, and they define that as meaningful community service with instruction and reflection. Um, so that was something that I saw a lot is that the students are going to be working on a, doing a lot of reflective work and a lot of internal work and me as well. So we're on to our first activity. Um, activity one, you have this also in your handout. Um, since the service learning objectives um, or courses are linked to our learning objectives. I want you to write three learning objectives for a service learning course or a service learning component that you can implement into an existing course. That's our first step. Then we are going to identify two to three services or activities that meet the learning objectives that you have outlined. So I'll give you a few moments to work on that um, and then we're going to be sharing with the partners around us. So let's take about three minutes to think about some objectives, right? What are the learning objectives for your course or the activity? Okay, si tienen por lo menos un objetivo, we can think about a service or activity that meets that objective, right? And then I want you to share with your partner. ¿Cómo son similares o diferentes? Are your learning objectives incorporating action verbs? How are you going to assess, right, um, the learning objectives? And how can we categorize the services or activities that align with the objectives that you are creating. Because we're like, eventually we're gonna think about what community partnerships then can you cultivate to meet the objectives and complete the services. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, 
Well, yeah, that's like, I'll not see you. Okay, encontramos? What objectives were you able to identify? The objectives or the activities? Both or either, whatever you want to share. Hmm? Could you think of one? Yeah, I can do one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so aside from like the productive abilities and my objectives, one of the ones that's important, at least at my university, because we're very focused on social justice, I have one of the objectives is to describe the importance of language access and language justice. And so for the activity, um, uh, during their service learning, I have them prepare self-reflections based on their project. And I have them incorporate like court cases or readings on the consequences of not offering language services and things that can go wrong. So I mentioned to my partner that like, we recently read one where the family took this teenager to the hospital and they said, Está intoxicado. And like, they didn't offer proper translation and interpreting services. And they were like, well, this is just some drunk kid in a gang. Let's send him home. Oh. Because intoxicado, they were hearing like, oh. Well, you don't they were like, oh, he's intoxicated. <laughs> yeah, and not like, like intoxicado can mean like you're sick, like the sol, insolación or something. But since they didn't offer the service, right. he like, no, he was like, but he's the parent. He, okay, not the girl is the one that died. The, they thought she was pregnant. That's right. Okay. The they and they sent him home, and it had like very, very grave consequences. Right. So I have them connect their own project to why language justice and language access is necessary for their community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Okay, that's a good like first step too, and then maybe that could even transition to um, developing, right, those services or providing them, right, in some way. Mm -hmm. Good, any other examples? Services or objectives, activities? Mm -hmm. ¿Y cuántas veces tienen que hacer the tutoring sessions? ¿Por cuántas semanas? Pero por cuántas semanas? Como 10 semanas tal vez. Creo que son como 12. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you cultivate the relationship with that district? Yes, and do you do that every semester? No. It's with a certain class, linked to a certain okay, class. One specific class is called Research for Community Engagement. Mm, okay. And so we do a research project, 
it, but it's through that community. So maybe they have um, other students that are being sent to them from other courses or maybe other universities. Oh, anyone who wants to volunteer. Can okay. Right, or for your, or for UT Austin. Yes, okay, yes. So those are all like different things to take into account, right, when we're thinking about the, the service learning. So this I took from Lauther Pareda. She provides some different uh, community partners um, in her article and also the different services that they provided. So maybe you can think about how does this look similar or different from the services that you were thinking of? Um, or even the learning objectives or the different types of activities. Right, a lot of, a lot of tutoring, like a lot of tutoring happens or mentoring, right? So this is a lot of um, internal reflective work, one-on-one, -on -one, like no, like as you were saying. Is there anything on here maybe that surprises you or stands out to you? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. She just put you on the spot. creating a lot of great connections. Yes. Right, awesome, thank you for sharing that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the community partnerships that we are um, cultivating or that I have been working on this, this semester. Um, so we have been working with the language access um, manager or director um, through the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Department through the City of San Antonio. 
Um, and one thing that they were really interested in when in our discussions was trying to find a way to be more connected with the community. Um, they have sent out a ton of questionnaires and surveys to community members um, and they didn't get they got a great response rate, um, but they wanted to do more of like town halls um, or discussions within the community. But um, a lot of them maybe don't speak Spanish or um, they are not confident in their own skills in Spanish. So one thing that they thought um, we might be able to partner with each other is having students um, leading these discussions. But in order to do that, the students also need to have a little bit of training themselves. So we do have this Center for Dialogue and Deliberation through UTSA where they can get some training to um, host these types of like critical conversations in Spanish or in Spanglish, right? Um, and uh, the idea is that the students themselves would plan this event, um, help um, organize it and um, that that could be a transferable skill that they use um, to market themselves when they then graduate, right? That's something that they can um, discuss, right? Something that helps make them stand apart. Um, another partnership that we're cultivating is with the World Languages um, program through our local um, ISD. They have a 90% Hispanic or Latino student population. Um, and the students here are going to be focused on working with the instructors, kind of similar uh, tutoring, after school tutoring, but um, more so is creating events in conjunction with the instructors um, that have to deal with whatever that they're seeing right in their curriculum um, and applying that uh, towards the um, activities that students are doing with their Spanish club. Right, so here the students are going to be working with them on these important topics. It's going to be in the fall semester so they can connect it to um, Las, Fiesta, Las Fiestas Patrias, they can connect it to um, different winter holidays or celebrations, um, and they're also getting these um, kind of like event building skills, right? How do you organize and plan these events? Um, and the idea is also for the students to uh, serve as mentors, right, to a lot of our middle school or high school students um, and for those students in K-12 to um, want to go to the university, hopefully UTSA, um, and that they see themselves as being like future college students as well. We also have a community center. Um, it's the Westside Community Center through the university, and they have already an established program where students can act as digital ambassadors for people in the community who maybe don't have access to um, Wi-Fi, a, a desktop computer, uh, because a lot of the city's applications are done online now. Um, and you have to complete them online and you have to turn them in that way. Um, so they're gonna be getting some training on these very specific applications, how to work with different community members who need to fill these applications out, and then they do it together right on the computer. So they're working as digital ambassadors in this side. Um, and then the last partnership that we're working on is with the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center on the Museo del West Side where they have um, a lot of different um, community interviews that have been done in Spanish or in Spanglish, um, and they want to transcribe them, um, and they want to be able to use them in future um, research work or archival work. Um, so it's a way for the students who might be interested in um, different types of um, either archival um, or, you know, digital work to um, participate right through the Museo del West Side. And it's a very, very specific um, local community, right, based museum. So these are the partnerships that we are working on or that I have been um, meeting with different uh, people throughout the semester. Um, and one of the things that I want to think about, and I'm gonna put, I have it in there for the ongoing and future work is, how do I sustain these partnerships for more than just one semester? And what does that look like? Um, and that's kind of where our 
SHL program comes in, where we're going to be uh, creating, having two uh, community-based events every semester. So we're hoping to partner with some of these same organizations to keep those partnerships going. Okay, so for our second discussion, um, I really wanted you all to think about what community partnerships could help your students accomplish the objectives or services that you created? Does your institution have any connections to these organizations already? What resources are already available? Um, and what service learning opportunities are already available for your students, either fully dedicated courses or different components that are being implemented in other courses? Some of this we may have already kind of touched on, but I wanted you to, to maybe do a little bit more research into your own organization or institution and see what is already available to you that you could take advantage of. So let's take about three minutes, three to five minutes um, to think about this and maybe talk about with the people that are around you. Okay, I know we have like 10 minutes left and the lunch is coming in, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But let's just think about what partnerships could you identify? Were there specific local organizations, businesses, community centers, cultural centers um, that you thought of? Anything like just like a like a specific place, right? Like a museum, because you, I, yeah. yeah, I saw your museum, and in Austin we have Mexi Cafe, and um, yeah, so I thought like working with them. Yeah. Museum for just uh, the past time I worked with the Museum of South Texas, where my students translated their everything they had for the public mm -hmm. from English into Spanish. So that's a good place. And another uh, association that might work would be, uh, in my case, that worked for translation would be uh, uh, Catholic Charities. Mm. So the students had uh, some opportunities to, to translate their marriage, uh, their marriage, uh, their pre marriage. Somebody who wants to get married, they, maybe they need to be a guy of the Catholic Church. There's also some. some uh, so to have those in English and Spanish or whatever types Spanish. of mm -hmm, specifically, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, also, uh, they had uh, Catholic charities had paid uh, some people in Latin America to translate their 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 guides, and so they wanted. Uh, somebody to moderate because they had been translated, I think, in Uruguay, and so a lot of people didn't understand what they were, what they were reading. Right, because even though it's in Spanish, it's not necessarily reflective of the language that the, yes. the Spanish that the community so they uses. That, uh, community sources sometimes are better than going out there. Right, because even though somebody from another country might represent that Spanish or give it kind of like that um, authority in a way, it's not, maybe it doesn't uh, connect with the way that people in the community use their, that's a good, good. Um, and well, I was gonna have us try to draft an email <laughs> so that you could send to a community partner. I can share the emails, the drafts of the emails that I sent, um, but really when I was trying to work with different organizations, if you just include a brief like why do you want to partner with this organization? How is there um, like a mutually beneficial uh, relationship or how do you envision that? And maybe even an agenda for the meeting. Um, it, it was really helpful to get those meetings set up with the different partners that we've already established. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about, I know we only have a couple minutes left, is the types of assignments that can be incorporated um, into these courses, and a lot of them are reflection-based. A lot of them are journals, um, where students have to really think about um, what did their activities look like, um, and some of the things that I am working on to um, prepare for this course is 
how do I prepare my students to be successful in these interactions and in the, the different components, right? The, like culturally and linguistically in um, whichever organization that they choose to um, do their service in. What assessment practices am I going to use? How do I maintain these partnerships? And um, what types of future partnerships can I establish that are engaging in more critical uh, service learning components um, that are more politically or civically minded? Right? Those are some of the things that we're thinking about um, as we move forward. Uh, but I think I, I wanted to end so that we can all eat because everyone's probably hungry. But thank you. We have maybe a couple minutes if you have any questions, or I kind of talked to a couple of people already. So one of the things that we were discussing in this group is the idea of we need to be careful that students do not take away jobs from that organization staff or any sort of you know employees that they might have. Um, because we also don't want to go there and say, hey, here's free labor for you. Right? So one of the things I include in the emails Precisely that the student, I, I set some parameters that the student needs to have its own working space, they need to have their own supervisor in case anything happens. They also need to not take the position from, it doesn't have to, it should not be an existing position, they're not putting an existing position. Right. And the other thing is the quality, you know, how can I send a student who has never taken interpreting or translation to be an interpreter in an immigration clinic, for instance? You know, how can I even ensure that? You know, you know, just because it's pro bono, because it's free, it should not be back on. So, you know, quality assurance, that's also a major issue. And, you know, so trying to balance these things are extremely difficult, especially because the community partner may see this as an opportunity to provide services, but also an opportunity to not pay for those services. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of things to navigate and in, in th these different types of challenges, but a lot of the um, organizations that we have partnered with right now, they, they need a lot of extra help that they don't, ha that they're not able to get at the moment, right? Like they have more work than they have the, the employees. So I think a lot of times too, they, um, it's not necessarily something that, salute, that they, um, that somebody, um, a position that the students would be taking away from somebody else. It's um, trying to add more onto it, um, like with, uh, with the high schools um, or the, the districts that we're working with. They're working with the instructors during like after school tutoring um, to come up with organ uh, different events that align with the, the different weekly themes that they're seeing. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, it's definitely something um, to consider, right? And you bring up a really good point. Um, but I don't, hmm. it's, it's hard to because a lot of the types of, of work that the students are gonna be doing, they have to kind of turn those, those things into, into us, like, like me as the instructor um, or the different, um, point of contact, the person that they're going to be working with to talk to, to do those different quality assurance checks that you're talking about. Um, and I want to engage in kind of more critical types of service learning, um, but I don't know, it's, it's hard when I don't know the students yet and like what, what, are, what are their backgrounds? What are their majors? What are they going to be doing after they graduate? What are they... Um, what are they working on, or what? what like, where, where do they? Where are they starting from? Right. So, I'm new into all of this, and um, I'm excited to kind of see where it goes. This is the first time we're going to offer it. Are you planning a plan B? I'm planning like <laughs> plan A through Z. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, like, what if you know the student ends up not needing to use the target language, for example, at their Yeah, we're designing everything so that they would hopefully have to use that, um, but I don't think that it's expected for every single interaction every single time. So there's a little bit of flexibility there. Yes. Oh, 
and it's 12.15.